Good morning, my name is Michelle Carter. I'm from the Aerospace Corporation. And we're gonna get started with the summary session. The summary session is a um, outbrief of the working group sessions that we held, that were held yesterday. Um, we had some very interesting, um, fruitful uh, discussions and uh, we're gonna go down and invite uh, each of the, the chairs from the working groups to um, summarize their session. We're gonna start off with uh, uh, Dr. Craig Lee and he's going to summarize the cloud computing for ground systems session. Oh great, thank you Michelle. So I can't believe it, but this is I think the eighth time that Ramesh and I have been doing this breakout session on cloud computing. Um, I hope a number of you uh, recognize me from having been around um, this, <laughs> this meeting for, for quite a while. Uh, so the goals around the, talking about cloud computing are basically all the things that you would expect to, uh, to see that, uh, you know, what are the requirements for the adoption and migration to cloud systems? Uh, what are the benefits and challenges? What are the enablers? Um, how does the convergence of cloud computing and big data actually affect uh, how ground systems are going to be architected. And, and also something that I think is very important that uh, might be uh, underappreciated is that as multiple organizations move to a cloud or multiple clouds or different organizations have their own cloud, how do you manage uh, the boundaries between those clouds and also the multiple missions that are running on those clouds? And that's where this notion of, of federation management comes in, which I think is going to be something that um, is going to be a uh, sort of a, a defining characteristic of how these systems mature. So um, the actual uh, presentations of panelists, um, I, you, can, you can see the list here. This is what was uh, on the, um, uh, the, the website so far. I'm not gonna read that uh, word for word, but just as key points from each one of those talks, um, Justin Boss from Kratos you know, talked about flying small sat constellations, and he says it's, it's, uh, you know, it's feasible with significant cost savings. Uh, Justin Sanchez from Harris um, basically talked about the work that they're doing and they say, well, there's, there's no significant roadblocks that we see, but you do have to pay constant attention to your security profile. Uh, in terms of Dave Sims and, and Wend Etherland from Kubos, this was actually a very interesting talk because they are not from the space community per se. They are essentially entrepreneurs. It's like a 12-person company and the way that they approach code development and, and, and deployment is, is very different. And so I encourage people to go look at, at their, they have an open source and closed source between the flight software and, and, the, and the ground system, but I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Uh, in terms of um, Joe McNamee from Booz Allen, they talked about an agile cloud-based common software framework. And of course, having that common framework um, enables you know, faster project startup and, and a lower barrier to entry uh, and so forth. Uh, finally, uh, Ramesh and Steve Marley from Aerospace talked about the NIST big data reference architecture, and I don't know how many people are following that work, but um, again, this is a, a reference architecture that tries to nail down the major concepts around cloud, or rather data providers and data consumers, and how you manage all of that data in between the two. And uh, they argued that is actually directly relevant to what um, uh, uh, ground systems have to do. Uh, in terms of the uh, town hall discussion, this is actually where I think the, the major benefit of the, of the uh, working group um, was derived because we had a very free-ranging conversation among all sorts of different uh, concepts that were brought up in terms of, of issues and in, in ways forward. Um, again, the, the notion of cloud federation, uh, it, it, that how that can enable the management of multiple clouds and multiple missions, how you manage the boundaries between these organizations that may be even running on the same cloud is something that has to be addressed in the, uh, in the future. And also something very interesting that came up. Most people talk about, well, how do I get my data into the cloud? How do I protect my data in the cloud? Um, someone finally asked, well, how do I ensure that my data is deleted from the cloud? Um, you know, people know that you, as you put uh, data into storage buckets and whatnot, that's like automatically replicated. Um, I had a Microsoft Azure guy tell me once that they're, depending on how they're doing updates, that Azure can actually replicate your data you know, up to seven times. They don't maintain seven all, all the time, but in their day-to-day -day operations, there may be up to seven uh, 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 copies existing. So, so that's an issue, is how do you actually make sure that your data is deleted from uh, whatever uh, cloud provider that you're, uh, that you're using. So as conclusions, as takeaway messages for this, um, the adoption of cloud computing is not going to go away. It's, it's here to stay. Um, the, the notion of adoption and migration 
Um, those issues abound in spades for any number of different reasons. Um, I know that we've had conversations around uh, how do you architect or refactor your application, how do you uh, use common services that your provider should have or could have, um, and so forth. Just the notion of what ground system software means is changing. It's no longer going to be this um, you know, monolithic thing that you build. It's going to be this conglomeration of, of chat tools, um, open source, you know, everything, you name it. And how these things are going to be put together is going to change. Uh, and then also, again, I've, I've sort of harp on this, but this notion of, of boundaries between clouds and missions and organizations is going to have to be managed in software. So the very last thing, I see that I'm out of time that uh, I want to invite everyone to this NIST IEEE uh, workshop on Cloud Federation that will be happening um, March 20th and 21st. Thank you. All right, so next we'll have Ryan Noguchi. He's going to present the summary from the Achieving the Resilient Enterprise through Model-Based Systems Engineering. Hi, so I'm Ryan Noguchi from Aerospace. Uh, my uh, co-lead, uh, Rob Pettit, and I led this uh, working group session I think this is the fifth time we've done this at, at GSAW. Uh, basically, uh, our goals for, actually I put this out of order, really we did not have any present presenters or panelists. We had, as we've had uh, every other time we've done this, an open group discussion with about two dozen participants, which is a good size to have a good, uh, really active discussion by a, a very wide range of folks who are able to all kind of get in on the conversation. So it's a really good format uh, for, for our purposes. But really, this, this is a, a recapping kind of the goals that we had for the session. Uh, we wanted to, to focus uh, quite a bit of our time talking about this year's GSAW theme and you know, achieving the resilient enterprise and how can we use model-based engineering methods to help us accomplish that. And you'll see in the next couple of slides, we, we approach this through uh, several different perspectives that I think uh, you'll find interesting. Uh, of course, uh, the format of the working group session is really an open discussion where we really get uh, a lot of the best practices and lessons learned. We find out about uh, a lot of the work that folks are doing right now in infusing and, and uh, adopting and enabling and, and evolving the practice of model-based engineering. Uh, and, and so that it's been a very, very, uh, one of the aspects of this working group session that people have liked is kind of to hear the success stories that folks have been having within, uh, within other organizations. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time after the break talking about, uh, in particular, a collaborative effort that we've been kind of talking about in the abstract in these GSAW working group sessions in the past. We wanted to uh, take a much more concrete approach and propose something very specific and start building a collaborative effort that could begin within the next few months uh, to start building something that would be useful for the ground systems community. And I'll talk about that in, in, in my last slide as well. So uh, achieving the resilient enterprise means a lot of different things depending on how you, uh, how you interpret that phrase. And so there are a lot of different perspectives you can take. And these were some of the perspectives that we felt were relevant from the perspective of applying model-based engineering methods to achieving that resilient enterprise. So what is a resilient enterprise? Uh, improving the resilience of individual systems. I, I think we are at the point now where we understand that model-based engineering techniques are a valuable tool in the toolbox for developing more robust and capable systems and, and, and developing uh, systems that are able to be more resilient. I don't think that's, uh, that's controversial. Uh, these techniques also enable us to better uh, architect resilience at the enterprise level and combining capabilities from a variety of systems to be able to provide enduring and resilient capabilities at an enterprise level bridging the gaps between multiple systems and, 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 and in few, uh, integrating them into various systems of systems that can collaborate and provide capabilities uh, in, in the uh, event of uh, failures or downtime or other things. Uh, we talked about resilience at the data layer and how you can use these model-based engineering techniques to help us architect a better data layer, data structures, data formats to enable better interchange of information uh, in, in, in the case of a particular system failure. You can go and use, uh, get data from another system and, and not have to spend a lot of time rejiggering formats in order to be able to use that data. Uh, but those are just kind of talking about from a system level. We can also talk about resilience of the enterprise from a process level. And these model-based engineering techniques, especially for, uh, from a systems engineering perspective, can help us enable faster and more agile processes. Uh, 
So we could execute engineering change uh, processes much more faster, much faster, much more comprehensively, uh, and we can execute better decision making, data informed decision making in the in the face of operational uh, incidents, for example, and improve our ability to really communicate well across a broad spectrum of folks, many of whom are not going to be engineers or engineers within our discipline. Uh, additional ways you can look at resilience is of the workforce. Uh, by using these model-based systems engineering techniques, we can build a better shared understanding that enables us to provide better interoperability of our people, of our contractors, of our uh, ability to execute the mission with the people because now everyone has a better shared understanding of what the systems are and, and do. Uh, improving our ability to do software development in a much more uh, robust fashion. Um, and improving the resilience of the architecture itself. And these model-based engineering techniques can help us apply the discipline needed to work at the functional level, which can be much more enduring and robust. Uh, let's see, we talked uh, about a collaboration. And, and we really want to try to build a, a structure that allows us to better collaborate among the ground systems community. Uh, capture best practices, facilitate better model interoperability. And uh, we talked about a lot about the kind of the challenges involved in establishing any kind of collaboration, figuring out what's the appropriate level of scope and detail, figuring out what people are interested in and can participate in. And one of the things that we're going to be uh, proceeding over the next couple of uh, several weeks or so is to see if we can tag this onto the INCOSI infrastructure to support this ongoing and sustained collaboration. And, and I've already greased the skids with some of those folks, and I think there's a lot of appetite to really begin that, both within the GSOC community and the INCOSI community. So, thanks. All right, thank you. Did you pass the mic? Thank you. So next we'll have Don Sather. And Don's, Don's working group focused on realizing resiliency in space systems. Don? All right, our, our goals were, were to sit there and find out how, well, one of the things we first asked the people was, what does resiliency mean to you? And believe it or not, we got four different answers from four different panelists. Uh, not too much of a surprise there. At the bottom line is, we want to be able to maintain mission success despite any threats or, or uh, failure scenarios which may be encountered. But the question is, what is the mission that you're actually working with? We had this a list of our panelists. I want to thank them for uh, participating with us. Uh, especially the lieutenant colonel, he uh, came with two hours notice. The uh, previous person who was supposed to sit on the panel um, got called for a uh, briefing with STRATCOM. So uh, we're very grateful for Lieutenant Colonel Royer to, sit, uh, to come in for us. One of the big things that we see lacking is international national policy regarding the governance of space. It's not keeping up with the expansion that we see going on in space. As a matter of fact, the current White House policy that's in draft form again emphasizes commercialization of space, which is great. The problem is we have no policy or governance on what happens up there once they're there. Uh, what kind of behavior do we expect? Do we expect them to deorbit things after they're done with their missions? Um, do we just throw up a thousand objects into any orbit we want just because we think there's space there? What's the governing process? Who's managing this? There is, space is a finite resource, and uh, conjunctions have nasty ramifications for everybody for a long time afterwards. So how do we manage this? Those policies need to be worked. Uh, we need to keep the real mission in mind when you're considering redundancy. What is it that you're actually doing? Well, your mission typically isn't just to fly satellites, to fly satellites. Typically, there's a mission that's involved with that. You're getting data to the ground, perhaps images, or you know, if you're Digiglobe, you're, you're, you, 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 the bottom line are those images that you're getting on the ground. For NOAA, perhaps it's the weather pictures or the forecasting data that's coming down to the ground to get it in the hands of people who can use it uh, to save life, limb, and property. Uh, for the warfighter, information that they need to be able to conduct their battle. That's the mission. The mission is not flying the satellite. The, mission, the flying the satellite is simply a means to an end. And so when you're discussing resiliency, what does that mean? And quite often, I may speak blasphemy here, that means that it's not the satellite that's the redundant part. Perhaps it's something that's airborne or some other source of data that we are currently, that is not directly involved with space. Definition for resiliency, as we discovered, was mission dependent. Um, identifying what we would call emergency minimum capability. This is stuff that 
when all else goes down, something that I have to deliver. What is the minimum emergency capability that I need to deliver? Understanding what that is and then working to deliver that, that piece there is what's key and critical. Uh, common ontology uh, to, to help define resiliency, to put it into common terms, uh, would be helpful. We discussed resiliency in new ways, perhaps adapting resiliency um, requirements to mission need and enterprise needs. Okay, this is kind of a different thought. So, you know, NASA, for example, has grades of satellites that they have, um, A, B, C, and D, depending on the mission and, and what, what it's for and what the value is and is an experiment versus an operational system. Those types of things there. Different types of redundancy are required for each of those. Perhaps on the DOD side, we should be looking at that and have to, uh, predefined means for that. Uh, what needs to be traded? And again, looking outside the systems to find dependencies that affect stuff. As someone mentioned before, yep, I had generators on board my, my, uh, for my system. We had redundancy and resiliency uh, available to us. Someone took a backhoe, cut the main power cord that goes to the base. It took a week. We ran out of gas in four hours. Okay, so again, I ha sometimes have to think beyond my immediate system for what's, for what's going on. Uh, resiliency, again, must be end-to-end. -end. It's got to be backed into everything, business models, policies, um, acquisition processes, all of those things must be looked at for uh, redundancy and resiliency. And again, enterprise solution is composed of services. Um, and again, going back to service-based architectures, decomposing stuff to smaller elements that you can more easily manage. Uh, helps you to define uh, better resiliency, uh, better resiliency techniques. So, conclusion: uh, we are late to the game already in terms of policy and governance. Encouraging more people to go into space only is going to exacerbate the problem. Um, what do we do? Well, someone needs to get off the nickel and start doing this because policy takes a long time to develop, and agreements between nations takes a long time to forge. Resiliency must keep in mind the real mission. Identify your uh, emergency capabilities. Look across your entire system. An abstraction from the hardware layer, the, the virtualization, containerization techniques, which you've heard about the last few days, uh, as well as agile developments using a DevOps type environment, all will open up new opportunities uh, for um, resiliency and help us to respond to these ever-changing environments that we see. And again, thank you to all who attended and participated. And she's actually going to give the out brief for achieving resiliency in agile methods. Okay, okay, there we go. So I'm gonna try and see as I sit down, but it'll be fine. So first off, um, I wanted to thank all the participants that came to the working group this year. Um, as I, <clears throat> this is my first year here at GSAW, and my understanding is now this is the fourth year for the working group, the agile working group. Um, so thank you to the uh, participants who came. We had uh, two presentations that discussed uh, implementation of the Agile methodology um, from uh, GMV Aerospace, Dis uh, Aerospace and Defense. And then we also had a presentation from JPL on um, um, automating peer reviews, um, I think is just kind of the high level on that one. And then we went and had a general discussion around agile battle rhythm. And I've got a lot of charts on that, which you'll be able to read through um, once the materials are available online. But we essentially talked about who, what, when, where, why, how, uh, roles, responsibilities, how often do you um, meet, what meetings do you have, um, looking for um, ideas and best practices from everybody in the room as to what worked well for them, um, what hasn't worked well for them, um, you know, we talked a little bit about co-location for Agile. It, it tends to work a lot better if your teams are co-located, but understanding that that can't always be possible. So we had some ideas that came out around that. Um, and then talking a little bit more about how many people would you have on a team? Um, how many teams would you have? How often would you release, um, deploy, et cetera? Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail on those. But I did want to get to this chart, which talked about um, how do we um, build in the illities or the re resilience into a software system that we're implementing using Agile. Um, 
And one of the things we talked about was, you know, from an architecture perspective, and I think that was talked about earlier a lot, um, needing to spend more time up front in the architecture uh, to build the resilience in. And you can, you can implement or build an architecture in an agile way. It's just a matter of how you break up the work. Um, you don't have to immediately jump into coding and development. Um, you can spend your first build of sprints just designing, um, discussing, engineering, um, as long as, you know, the process does not disallow that, uh, actually it fosters it. So it's just a different way of organizing your work. So we talked about um, how do we um, develop an architecture in Agile, you know, knowing the interfaces and the interoperability between the components, um, using an architecture runway so that our systems engineers are embedded with our teams, so that work, they're working a little bit ahead to, um, uh, to make sure all the questions have been answered before you get somebody developing. Um, and so forth. So I want to get more to the pain points since I'm talking a lot. Um, so a couple pain points that um, were identified in the room is getting buy-in for Agile at, at the middle, ma middle management layer. Um, you know, you kind of have to give them the what's in it for me. And, and we talked about doing a lot of things like getting a lot of quick wins. And a big uh, one of those things is MVP in Agile, which is a minimum viable product. So starting to turn things around, develop more quickly, showing things to managers that look, you know, we were able to build this in, you know, one month's time versus six months' time. You just have to start proving that the process works. Um, another pain point that was identified was culture shock because Agile is different. Um, some people hear Agile and they think, that, oh, it's gonna be a lot easier, we don't need to be as involved. And the reality is with Agile, you need to be more involved. You need to have more collaboration um, and you need to start with the executives at the top, flow it all the way down. Um, and you have to be willing to um, take the covers off things and be transparent and share um, and talk about things that are going well and things that are not going well. And that's, that's, some people, they do that very easily. Other people, it's a little bit more challenging. And you just have to recognize that it might not fit every single person. Um, you, you know, as a former executive used to tell me, you gotta make sure you're in the right seat on the bus. Um, let's see, let's go to the next chart. Uh, we did talk about system acceptance. So how do you accept a system that you're building in an agile way? You know, at what levels do you do that? And overwhelmingly, everybody in the room agreed that um, you would have to accept it at a feature level or a capability level, and then at the overall system level as well, and doing a full end-to-end -end system test at the end. So it's not like you accept things at the very lowest level. You have to integrate everything. Those things don't go away when you do Agile. You have to do integration. Um, and oops, we're almost over with, but the only thing I wanna say on this must-haves is that all parties need to be Agile, from the top down, bottom up. Everybody needs to be talking Agile. And that's it, thank you. All right, thank you. So next we'll have Michelle. Johannes, and she will actually give a out brief or a summary on emerging technologies, protections, or pitfalls. Thank you. Michelle? Good morning, and so I worked with Scott Niebuhr on this to put this panel together, and our goal was really to bring together experts from the cybersecurity and the space field to just discuss technology. General Thompson told us on Tuesday two things. He wanted us to go fast, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we really saw this as an opportunity to bring together different technology and different groups for a cross-pollination of ideas. We had a lot of presenters or panelists. Um, we had representation from cybersecurity, space, uh, law enforcement, and a legal team, because when you're talking to the cops, it's always a good idea to have a lawyer. Um, and we also had an expert in staffing and recruiting. So again, it was a diverse group and had a really great discussion. So what did we talk about? Uh, we talked a lot about tools. Um, we got an understanding from our cybersecurity commercial vendors about some of the pain points that they had encountered when they were bringing their products to market. One that I really thought could be applied to the space environment was the idea of working with different protocols. A lot of the COT solutions that we see out there are working with internet protocols, and when it comes to a space system, we have our own set of protocols that those COTS products don't necessarily work with right away. So this was something that one of our vendors had also seen when they were trying to work with industrial control systems that have their own 
protocols, and so there was some lessons learned from having that discussion. We also learned that we can use some existing tools, and maybe we can use them in a way that wasn't necessarily what they were intended to be used for, so that was a great discussion, too, in just kind of broadening what is out there and how we can use it. We had a lot of discussion on uh, machine learning and the idea that unsupervised learning can then inform supervised learning to inform patterns of life. And it's also important to understand not just your steady state network, but also what a device looks like when it's new to the network. So that was a good discussion. We talked a lot about encryption, a lot about encryption. Um, and specifically, we talked about the hardware encryption versus software encryption. And we came to understand that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the idea of software encryption. Um, that's okay right now, because we're not at a place where we have the computing power to do it. But when we think about the cloud and virtualization, hardware encryption can be a little bit tough. So that's definitely a, dis a discussion that we expect to continue, and, uh, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, we talked a lot about roots of trust and operating in the idea that there's operating in a zero trust environment. Um, gone are the days when we can encrypt our communication links and build a nice crunchy perimeter around our systems and call it secure. So we talked about what is the future as we move forward in design. We have to